friends. Welcome to the Encore Alert Spotlight Forum. We developed this forum as a yearly follow-up to the Encore Alert Colloquium. Oncology is a fast-paced field where new treatments are being developed, tested, and improved. The colloquium was a way to focus on these novel therapies and give colleagues an update on the latest in oncology. The Spotlight Symposium was developed to slow us down a second, to place focus in areas where there is an unmet need, to let us know how oncology is in the entirety of the world, and most importantly, to make us aware that there is a geographic unfairness and an invitation to join and to do something about it. This forum launches the start of the Onco Alliance. This is an assembly of groups that together and through the use of our hashtag will raise awareness worldwide on research and findings highlighting racial inequities, patient advocacy, and global disparities. We proudly kick off the Global Assembly for Educational Equity. This is an assembly of national oncology societies from mostly low and middle income countries that will be working together with OncoAlert in order to make sure that we are meeting their needs and that our educational content is designed with the entirety of the global oncology community in mind. But now back to the spotlight forum. The forum will be four days in length. Day one, global inequities. Day two, World Health Day. Day three, racial disparities. Day four, patient advocacy. The length of these days are about an hour each and will be divided by different presentations. So now without further delay, the Spotlight Forum. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Enrique Soto. I am a medical oncologist specialized in geriatric oncology working at the National Institute of Medical Science in Mexico City. And today I'm going to talk about global inequities in access to supportive and palliative care. I would like to thank OncoAlert, specifically Dr. Morgan, for inviting me to participate in this talk, and also MASC, the Multinational Association of Supportive Care in Cancer, its current president, Dr. Davis, and president elect, Dr. Luzberg, who invited me to represent the organization in this talk. This is my Twitter handle in case you want to follow me. So over the next 12 minutes, I'm going to talk about inequities in supportive and palliative care globally, with a special focus on Latin America, which is the area of the world where I live and where I practice. The need for palliative care has never been greater than today, particularly with the COVID-19 pandemic increasing the number of deaths and the number of patients in need of supportive care. Currently, almost 20 million people are in need of palliative care worldwide for various diseases, ranging from non-communicable diseases, such as cancer, to infectious diseases, such as HIV, and others like trauma or poisons. Among, acute chronic, uh, among chronic diseases, certainly one of the most important requiring supportive and palliative care is cancer. And all patients with cancer, regardless of their age, may be in need of supportive and palliative care throughout the continuum of the disease. Sadly, palliative care infrastructure is vastly underdeveloped outside of high-income countries, while some regions of the world, such as North America and Western Europe, have increased the availability of palliative care services. This is certainly not the case in low- and middle-income countries, where palliative care is still lacking in most, uh, in most parts, particularly in rural areas and outside large cities. And this is mainly because there are many barriers for the implementation of palliative care. And in this talk, we're gonna discuss some of those barriers and how to mitigate them. This is the proportion of patients with uh, diseases requiring palliative care and the most important uh, conditions that need supportive and palliative care. As you can see, malignant neoplasms represent about a third of all cases requiring palliative care worldwide. And if we add, Leukemia, this is even more. However, the need for palliative care and the diseases that require palliative care vary greatly across regions of the world. So for example, while in some parts of the world, such as Africa, most of the patients that require palliative care have HIV, in the rest of the world, most of the patients requiring palliative care have malignant neoplasm. And this does not change a lot depending on the region of the world. So here, for example, we see Europe, 40% of patients require palliative care have cancer. But if we look at the Eastern Mediterranean region, this is 26%. Uh, 
Southeast Asia, 20%. So while the number of patients varies by region, cancer is the number one cause for requiring palliative care anywhere but in Africa. If we look at the distribution of patients requiring palliative care according to the income of the countries, we can see that although more than a third of patients live in high income and upper middle income countries, there is a significant proportion of patients who are in pain who require palliative care and who live in lower middle income or in low income countries where healthcare systems are vastly unprepared to offer them palliative care. And if we look at the age of the patients who require palliative care in the world, we can see that most are age 70 years or older, although there is a significant proportion of children who need palliative care. So here we can see that regardless of the age of the patient, regardless of the medical specialty, there is a need to know and to have some basis regarding supportive palliative care because your patients may need it regardless of their age. What are the challenges for implementation of supportive and palliative care worldwide that we are gonna discuss in the next few minutes? Number one is the lack of supportive and palliative care services in developing countries. Number two is the limited access to pain medication, particularly opioids. Number three, there is a lack of legal framework, both for the sale and acquisition of opioids and for the provision of palliative care. There is a significant lack of supportive and palliative care training, but and both at the undergraduate and at the postgraduate level. And finally, there are a lot of taboos and myths surrounding supportive and palliative care, particularly in the developing world. The first barrier and one of the most important is the lack of supportive care services. 69% of all supportive and palliative care services are located in high income countries. And let that sink in now. Three, two thirds of the world's supportive care are in high income countries, although we saw that only 36% of patients live there. Less than 5% of patients in need of palliative care in low income countries get it. So five out of 100. And as you can see in this map, this is the proportion or the number of supportive care services per 100,000 inhabitants. And as you can see, this is mostly in the north of the world, particularly in the US and Canada and in Western Europe but in Africa, South America, and Southeast Asia, there is a very low availability of palliative and supportive care services. And 24% of countries have no existing palliative care infrastructure at all. Here is the example of Latin America. This is from a, a paper we published a couple of years ago. And as you can see, only the most Southern countries in Latin America, Uruguay, Chile, and Argentina, that are, are also perhaps the more developed ones, have an advanced integration of healthcare, of palliative care into the healthcare system, while the rest of Latin America has mostly capacity building activities and isolated palliative care provisions. So there are wide, uh, wide disparities between continents, within continents, and even within countries. In, in some countries, some areas have more access to palliative care, like big cities, and others don't, like rural areas. And importantly, most supportive and palliative care teams in the developing world are located within hospital settings. So there is a lack of outpatient palliative care services, which are perhaps the most useful for providing pain control for patients with cancer. The second barrier is limited access to pain control. 82% of the world's population lacks appropriate access to opioids. And sadly, there have been no changes in global opioid consumption in the last year, in the last five years. This map is very illustrative. This was published in the Lancet a couple of years ago, and it shows the proportion of opioids that are used in uh, the different regions of the world. And as you can see, while patients or while Canada and the US have 3,000% their opioid needs, and Australia and some countries in Western Europe, the rest of the world has a very low provision of opioids. So in Mexico, there's only 36% of the need. In Bolivia, only 6% of the need. In China, 16% of the need. So this, there's a huge inequity in access to care that is driven by many factors, some of which we will analyze. So limited global access to morphine is a particular problem because morphine is a cheap alternative to control pain that's taken orally and that's relatively easy to prescribe. However, in many countries of the world, drug enforcement agencies and drug enforcement uh, regulations have led to a decrease in the import and sales of opioids. 
And in addition, many countries have very weak or vague opioid laws that make it difficult for physicians to prescribe it and difficult for pharmacies to sell them. In addition, there is a lack of financial incentives to produce and or commercialize morphine. And also there is a lack of government subsidies for morphine. So here in this graph, you can see the proportion of countries that report having a, an adequate supply of morphine in their pharmacies. So high income countries, 86% report adequate, adequate availability of morphine, upper middle income countries, 40%. And if we look at low income and lower middle income countries, this is below 20%. So below 20% of pharmacies have opioids available for sale for patients. The next barrier that, uh, and the next disparity in cancer control is the lack of palliative care legislation. So unfortunately, most countries in the world lack specific palliative care legislations. In some uh, countries, this is included into larger healthcare laws. Uh, but sadly, there is a limited availability of laws regulating palliative care services and also regulating advanced directives. And in addition, as I mentioned, pain control and other supportive care medications are seldom included in national health care plans. So here we can see that, for example, in a survey conducted across countries in the world, 32% 32, uh, 32 of countries had no integrated non-communicable disease policy with palliative care. 33% of countries had no integrated uh, non-communicable disease policy with cancer. And 15% of countries had no funding at all for palliative care. So there is a lack of laws and regulations for palliative care, mostly in the developing world. If we look at the example of Latin America, only five countries which are marked uh, in, with the um, orange squares have legislate, legislation specifically about palliative care, Peru, Colombia, Panama, Mexico, and Chile. And the other countries include palliative care as part of broader laws. And in addition, during the, five past, the, the past five years, only one country, Peru, has developed new uh, legislation. The next barrier and the next inequity in global palliative care is the lack of palliative care training. In many countries, palliative care is not recognized as a medical specialty, and most cancer care providers give no training in palliative care. And this includes not only doctors, but also nurses, social workers, and psychologists who should have some palliative care training and skills. In addition, many countries lack palliative or supportive care professional societies, and that this means that there are no meetings, no research, etc. In Latin America, again, as an example, only 15% of medical schools as of 2020 include palliative care as an independent course. So there is a huge need to increase the availability of palliative care training across the developing world. And this is a good area to build collaboration between high income and low and middle income countries. And the last but not least barrier is the existence of myths and taboos surrounding palliative care. These myths are prevalent among both patients and healthcare providers and include fears regarding the use of narcotic medication and, uh, and the fear of causing addiction. There is a false equivalence between supportive and palliative care, end of life care and euthanasia. And in many countries, uh, this may be a problem, particularly in countries where religion plays a, a great part in, in, in everyday life. There is also a belief that palliative care is only for older and weak, uh, older adults. And uh, this is not the case as we saw Many children uh, and younger people are in need of palliative care worldwide. And finally, uh, a, an important issue is fatalism, in which patients believe their outcomes are inevitable, and this leads to a lack of acceptance of interventions that are aimed uh, to mitigate pain or other symptoms. So how do we move forward? I'm, I'm going to leave you with some uh, recommendations and things uh, we could all think about uh, doing in our everyday practice and in our organizations. So we need financing. Palliative care needs to be included as part of universal health coverage worldwide. There is a need to improve access to medication. Pain control needs to be included in the essential medicine lists and its availability should be ensured. There is a need for the creation of palliative care policies. Uh, countries should have dedicated palliative care policies and laws that make it clear what palliative care is and who should provide it. There is a need to train healthcare professionals. Palliative care should be included in the curriculum of medical and nursing schools. And this is also an opportunity for global collaborations and for the creation of 
for example, build to our seminars like this aimed at training uh, healthcare providers in low and income countries. We need to measure things. We need to measure uh, access to palliative care. We need to measure the number of people who need it. And we need to measure its outcomes. And this leads us to the last one, which is research. We need to conduct research, particularly implementation research, in order to create and adapt models of palliative care for settings with uh, limited resources. So uh, with this, I leave you. There are a lot of challenges uh, for the implementation of palliative care globally, and there are sadly a lot of inequities and disparities. This has been improving under, over the last uh, five or 10 years, and there are also a lot of opportunities for improving access to care and for global collaborations. And I believe that this is an excellent forum to start these discussions and to work together for the future. Thank you very much for this invitation. Hello, my name is Bharti Devnani. I'm an oncologist from India. Thank you, Dr. Gil Morgan and Oncoalert Network for giving me this opportunity to speak on global inequities in cancer, the Indian perspective. So is there any definition for disparity? So the health disparity is defined as a particular type of health difference that is closely linked with social, economic, or environmental disadvantage. The important thing to note here is that race and ethnicity are not the only determinants of disparities and other avoidable inequalities like socioeconomic status, geographical location, and sex also play a role. This is uh, the agenda of my today's talk. I'll be first speaking on cancer profile in India. Cancer is not a notifiable disease in India. Although we have hospital-based cancer registries and population-based cancer registries, but it is estimated that the real cancer incidence is around 1.5 to 2 times higher than what is reported. And it is because of heterogeneity in the cancer registries across the nation. And it was also shown in a study conducted by Tata Memorial Hospital where they have compared uh, the registry incidence with the randomized screening study. And it was shown that the gap between study versus registry incidence varies from 1.5 to 2 times. And it is even more pronounced for oral cancer cases where it is around 9 times higher in the screening studies in comparison to registry incidence. India is a country of diversity and cancer is not an exception for that. As you can see in this graph, the state-wise incidence varies uh, from 270 per 100,000 population in northeastern region to 40 per 100,000 population. So India is one of those countries where within the country the incidence varies so much. Uh, next, I'll be talking about the affordability, access, and awareness about the cancer. So most of the cancers in India are present in advanced stages. And as you can see in this graph, 55 to 60% of breast cancers are diagnosed in advanced stages of disease. And that is even more uh, significant for cancers which occurs in low socioeconomic, uh, low socioeconomic status. So which is uh, like so cancer of cervix uh, is diagnosed in advanced stages in around 90% of the cases. Patients of cancers have limited access to diagnostic facility, whether it is mammogram or PET CT scan in this region in comparison to the West. Also, the patient to oncologist ratio is also not optimized and uh, uh, oncologists in India are catering almost 16 times more patients than the West. Access to comprehensive cancer centers is also limited. According to the 2014 data, there are around 250 comprehensive cancer centers in the country. The important thing to note is that uh, most of these cancer centers are in eight metro cities. Uh, so the Patients which live far away from those areas 
have uh, uh, have problem to access these facilities and uh, it is the underprivileged and the people living in countryside are the most sufferers the same is true for access to radiotherapy facilities radiotherapy is an important part of treatment in the cancer management and uh, because of the limited facility and geographical distribution of cancer centers and uh, this is again a logistic problem uh, to live in a city far from their uh, native place and that leads to daily loss of daily wages and uh, the incidence or uh, upon the lenac ratio is uh, more than 3000 in in this country because of the limited comprehensive cancer centers the access to clinical trial is also limited although 60% of the cancers in india are due to preventable diseases like head and neck cancers which are due to smokeless tobacco or cancer cervix which are uh, because of poor uh, hygienic conditions but still uh, you can see in this heat map that the uh, interstate variation for preventable trials is huge and uh, the same is true for therapeutic trials affordability remains always an issue for low middle socio economic countries and the same is true for india also the cost of cancer treatment is low in our country but still most of them cannot afford uh, that cost also that cost too if we talk about the awareness about the disease uh, in a, a breast cancer awareness study it was shown that around half of the women were never heard of breast cancer and many of them have no knowledge of symptoms and there is very little uh, percentage of uh, women who are practicing breast self examination uh if we talk about the gender and socio economic differences uh cancer is a social stigma in our country uh it is considered as a death sentence still in many parts of country and people are fear of being diagnosed with cancer uh, women are the more uh, women are the sufferers because here it is patriarchal society and women have limited access to medical care and mostly nutritionally de deprived um, still one third of indian uh, patients think that cancer is a contagious disease and uh, so you can see that we see uh, cancer patients in this advanced condition where people see t1 t2 tumors uh, we are seeing like you can say the t9 t10 kind of tumors also the incidence of cancer in women is more in india in comparison to other nations then there are some unique risk factors or you can say india centric cancers for example gallbladder cancer which occur because uh, occur along the uh, gangetic river and cervical cancer and head and neck cancers because only 2 to 3% of women in rural areas have access to sanitary napkins and because of poor menstrual hygiene and high parity and lack of awareness the cervical cancer is still one of the leading cancers in india in women india is the biggest consumer of smokeless tobacco so in in this part of world the head and neck cancers are mainly because of because of smokeless tobacco use in comparison to the west where it is big, may, may, uh, mainly because of uh, uh, because of the cigarette smoking or hpv related cancers so because of the different risk factor it is important to do a translational research for india centric cancers at one end india is uh, facing the problem of preventable cancers on the uh, say on the other hand there is increase in the cancers related to lifestyle and environmental factors for example incidence in breast cancer is the most common cancer in india which is related to lifestyle changes and most of the cities 
uh, in the recent survey, 15 out of 20 uh, most polluted cities are in India. There are many efforts ongoing in public and private sector to improve the cancer care in India. One of the ambitious projects of Government of India is National Health Protection Mission, where underprivileged uh, society is provided with cashless benefits to uh, take treatment at both public and private and paneled hospital across the country. Also, the universal screening for common cancers has been clubbed with uh, non-communicable diseases like hypertension and diabetes. And the three most common cancers, uh, which is oral cancer, breast cancer, and cervix cancer is included in the universal screening uh, for common cancers. Strengthening the grassroots level is very important. So the uh, strengthening of primary health care, uh, comprehensive health care and district hospital is very important for the early detection and awareness. It is important to uh, receive uh, the patient in early phases of cancer to, um, to, for the better cure and uh, to improve the mortality upon incidence ratio. Now there are many centers of excellence in the India for clinical facilities and research. One of them is National Cancer Institute, which is the biggest public sector uh, investment uh, uh, from the after the independence, and uh, one wing of which is entirely dedicated to translational research for India-centric cancers. Also, we have National Cancer Grid for better collaboration for cancer care and Indian guidelines to guide the cancer treatment. Still, we have uh, to achieve complete registry within the country. We would require adequate infrastructures, infrastructure and facility. And uh, early detection is very important uh, because we see most of the cases in advanced stages. And integration of research and clinical facilities is also very important, which we have to achieve. These are the references for my presentation. Thank you very much. I would like to thank Hong Kong Alert Spotlight Forum for inviting me to speak about the evolving role of social media platforms to enhance knowledge of young oncologists. The global cancer burden is significant as one in six people die from cancer and one in five people will develop cancer before the age of 75. Furthermore, it is expected that the incidence will increase to almost 30 million cases per year by the year 2040. More than two thirds of these cases will be in low and middle income countries that are ill-equipped to deal with complex and expensive cancer treatments. Cancer care has changed and evolved enormously in recent years due to rapid expansion of knowledge and new treatment options. There is a need for greater access to global education for healthcare professionals to implement evidence-based practice and achieve real progress in cancer care. In many parts of the world, there is a severe shortage of both general and specialist oncologists. Educational disparity impacts the quality of care for patients and further exacerbates the healthcare disparities that already exist. Increasing number of cancer cases adds additional pressure on healthcare workers and healthcare systems. Inadequate education of healthcare professionals is one of the most urgent issues in delivering quality cancer care. We must strive to improve education and dissemination of knowledge and technologies to reduce inequalities in cancer care. There are several educational disparities in low to middle income countries due to low financial investments in healthcare, unsupportive environment for research, political and economical instability, language barrier, brain drain migration of the best and brightest individuals to high income countries, 
leading to significantly lower scientific productivities in these countries compared to high income settings. In addition, there is also a number of challenges in oncology training, such as increasing workload in hospital, lack of research opportunities, lack of structured teaching, keeping up to date with latest research, issue of burnout, lack of supervision and mentorship, and inequities in conference attendance, either due to hospital hierarchy, financial reasons, high educational debt, family situation, or difficulties with childcare. COVID-19 pandemic has caused unprecedented changes to all aspects of our lives. It had immediate and dramatic impact on cancer care, fundamentally disrupting and altering the practice in oncology. It caused several changes in professional duties and disrupted training courses and career opportunities for young professionals. For example, Rotations between departments and hospitals were canceled, as well as numerous educational events and fellowships. COVID-19 has had a significant psychological impact on mental health of healthcare professionals and patients. On the positive side, the pandemic has caused the turn to telemedicine, which is now increasingly used by oncologists and patients with largely positive experiences. Pandemic has really caused a virtual turn in medicine with increased use of online learning. Online learning has ensured continuity of learning, also making education more accessible to many oncologists, especially those living in low and middle income countries. This new normal means that meetings have switched from in-person to virtual. In fact, virtual meetings have numerous advantages despite having some drawbacks. The pandemic has certainly highlighted the importance of social media in our personal, but also in our professional lives. So, can we use social media professionally in oncology? There are several uses of social media in oncology. Social media enables faster and more diverse exchange of scientific knowledge. Due to huge volume of information published on a daily basis, Clinicians are limited to learn about new research. Social media can be very helpful as you can find news about newly published articles in major oncological journals and relevant data presented on oncological meetings. These new research findings and their relevance to clinical practice can then be discussed on these platforms in a timely manner. Therefore, social media enhances the education of healthcare professionals and active learning and can even accelerate research. Social media platforms are a great place for networking as they bridge geographical barriers. You can use social media to improve patient care and trust in healthcare professionals as many patients are increasingly using social media for health purposes. Importantly, we can counteract misinformation and direct people to accurate, reliable sources of information. Furthermore, Social media platforms allow learning about new educational opportunities. They also help to increase cancer awareness and enhance knowledge in all aspects of cancer care. Finally, I would like to say a few words about OncoAlert. OncoAlert is an international group of oncology professionals and patient advocates with common goal of ending cancer. OncoAlert shares relevant, trustworthy, evidence-based information to colleagues and patients. It facilitates practice-changing information in real time, keeping up to date with all the developments in the field. It empowers patient advocates, emphasizing the needs of patients. It increases awareness about available educational and career opportunities and promotes healthy lifestyle. OncoAlert first started on Twitter as this is the most used and preferred network for professional use. However, it soon expanded its network to Facebook and Instagram, wanting to reach a wider audience, especially focusing on young oncology professionals in order to capture their attention with news about oncology developments while they are scrolling their news feeds. Recently, OncoAlert also moved to LinkedIn, opened its YouTube account, 
and has been releasing very successful podcasts. So in conclusion, oncology is fast developing field of medicine, which requires constant update with the advances and changes in practice. Social media can be additional powerful educational tool to facilitate access to relevant health information important for clinical practice. So be active professionally on social media, learn, apply and spread your knowledge. Thank you for your attention. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mariana Brandão, and I'm a medical oncologist at Institut Jules Bordet in Brussels, Belgium. Today, I'm going to talk about global inequities in Europe. Although Europe is a small continent compared to others, there are a lot of inequities in, within the region. Just for, your, for reminding you, in the left, we have the map of Europe with its division in four regions northern, western, southern, and central eastern Europe. And on the right, you can you see the 27 member states of the European Union. There are a lot of differences regarding healthcare expenditure in Europe, both within the European Union, in which we can see that, for instance, Luxembourg spends five times the amount of money in healthcare compared to Romania, but also outside the European Union, in which, for instance, Switzerland spends 10 times the amount that is spent in Albania. And of course, this translates in also in cancer care expenditure, with the highest amount being spent in Western and Northern Europe. And we see here the amount in each country. Um, and Romania is the country that spends the least, 106 euros per capita. And Switzerland is the one that spends the most with almost 600 euros per inhabitant. So there are a lot of disparities in cancer care across Europe. So I'm going to focus in three. First, on availability of cancer drugs, then regarding the implementation of tumor boards, and lastly, about enrollment in clinical trials. Regarding access to clinical medicines in cancer, ESMO has made a survey of five years ago um, regarding the availability of different anti-cancer medicines. And here are the drugs that the World Health Organization considers to be essential some chemotherapy drugs, intrastuzumab. And we see that in countries with the lowest GDP and lower economical development, that there were a lot of problems regarding availability. Um, and this is also true for access to targeted anti-cancer drugs in which the disparities are even greater. We see here for breast cancer that there are many drugs from pertuzumab or GDM1 that were not available at all in most of these countries. And the same for colorectal cancer or lung cancer. Then regarding access to multidisciplinary care, there are also a lot of inequities. And this is worrisome because we know that most uh, oncological societies um, emphasize the need for multidisciplinary care as an essential part of cancer care. Why? Because we can choose the best possible treatment for the individual patient and we streamline decisions and we improve quality. And there's demonstrated that this can improve survival of patients. So in this survey that we conducted last year, a global survey involving more than 70 countries, we see that half of the respondents came from Europe, 40% from Western Europe, 14% from Eastern Europe. And in North, South and Western Europe, we see that the vast majority of respondents had a, regu a regular multidisciplinary tumor boards in their institution. However, in Eastern and Central uh, Europe, around 17%, an important proportion of respondents did not have access to these uh, meetings, which is worrisome. 
Lastly, regarding enrollment in clinical trials, we also presented last year this uh, analysis about the number and distribution of clinical trials in Europe across the last 10 years. And we see that countries in Western and Southern Europe have the highest absolute number of cancer clinical trials. But then when we adjust for population, we see that still are the countries in Western and also Southern Europe that have the highest number of trials. And we see here countries in Eastern Europe that have a lower number of trials. And of course, we can say that this may be related to GDP, and we see that there is a correlation between the two of them, but there are a lot of outliers. We see Belgium and Denmark that perform really well. Um, and then we have Luxembourg, which has, has a really high GDP, but a lower number of trials. So it's not only about GDP and economical development. There are other factors like legislation of training of staff that could explain these differences between countries. So why is this a problem overall? Because this translates in differences in cancer survival. And this is really very clear from this map from WHO that shows that overall, if you look to all cancers, that the mortality from cancer is higher in Eastern and Central Europe compared to um, Western, Northern, Western and Southern Europe. We could also say that this could be related to the case mix, that are the kind of cancers that exist in Eastern and Central Europe are have a worse prognosis than the ones that exist in, in the rest of Europe. But when we look to individual cancers, and I start here with breast cancer, which is a highly curable disease, we see the same pattern. We see very high rates of cure in Northern and Southern Europe, but we see that in Eastern and Central Europe, that mortality is much higher. And we look when we look to colorectal cancer, we see the same pattern. And we, when we look to a worse prognosis disease like lung cancer, we, we continue seeing this uh, difference in terms of mortality, which is higher in, in Eastern and Central Europe compared to Northern, Western and Southern Europe. So what can we do to improve this? So first of, of all, in terms of access to cancer drugs, we can start by identifying the drugs that should be prioritized to be reimbursed. And for that, we can use the ESMO magnet of the clinical benefit scale, which really clearly ranks the benefits of each drug. And then lobby to improve the sequencing of regulatory approval and reimbursement decisions. We, we still see in many countries, and including in mine and here in Belgium, that between the approval by EMA and actually the, the reimbursement decision, sometimes we have 12 months, 18 months that elapse and we cannot afford this time. Our patients cannot afford to wait that long. And lastly, also more flexible contracting. Maybe this is, we can start thinking about more regional continental schemes of negotiating with pharma companies the price of drugs in, in order to improve access. And then regarding implementation of tumor boards, every oncologist in his or her institution should strive to have a meeting in which all cases of cancer are discussed before the beginning of anti-cancer treatment, because this really has an impact of, on patient outcomes. And of course, Sometimes it's not possible to have all disciplines and the same institution, but for that we can use remote multidisciplinary tumor boards. We can use teleconferences, and now we are used to that thanks to COVID. So we can we can use it in the future. And lastly, regarding clinical trials, we should lobby to make legislation in each country more flexible and agile in order to speed up processes and maybe even to centralize some procedure at a national or European level. And the VHP harmonization process regarding clinical trials in, within the European Union is a very good example of that. And finally, it's fundamental to train staff in cancer clinical research because it's only with good professionals that we can have good trials and good care to, to patients. 
And here I also show you the European Cancer Organization, the essential requirements for quality cancer care, which are very nice guidelines that are available for most cancers. Here is a, a, an example of lung cancer in which we have all the, in which in the guidelines, we have the requirements for each of the disciplines involved and also to the extended multidisciplinary team. And they also emphasize the importance of access to information, patient advocacy, MDT, so multidisciplinary tumor boards performance, and also the training, education, and uh, enrolling of patients in clinical trials. So I really advise you to read this. So thank you so much for your attention. I hope to see you soon. And remember, together we can make the difference. Thank you very much for joining us for the Spotlight Forum. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow.